Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of the Haitian Revolution, right? Well, we're now going to be actually switching things up a little bit, and we're going to finish up the Haitian Revolution, right, under that guy that we left off in class talking about, known as Toussaint L'Ouverture, right? Originally named Toussaint Bredas. Some people refer to him as the Black Napoleon, but I personally think that Napoleon is the white Toussaint, right? Now, going into it, though, something we need to understand, though, is going to wrap that whole thing up, and then we're going to move into a new topic or concept, right? Where we're going to jump back over to Europe and then pick up where we left off when we were talking about those isms, right? When we talked about those isms, we talked about, like, everything that happened right after Napoleon left, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to go, like, uh, 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 and then jump right back over there and pick up where we left off talking about conservatism, classical liberalism, and socialism, and kind of kick start our, like, progression to what's Europe going to be like after Napoleon? Napoleon's gone, right? But go ahead really quick and watch this little clip that I recorded last year about wrapping up the Haitian Revolution, and I'll see y'all in a sec. Born into slavery with a different name and things like that, and grew to actually own a plantation of his own, and also ended up becoming very educated as a young man and stuff like that, and earned his freedom later on in his life. He led this slave revolt, and he is going to be the reason why slavery gets abolished on this island. And his name was, say it with me real quick, he is awesome, he is the man, look at him right there, he is sometimes historically known as the Black Napoleon, right? Because he was that successful in his military campaigns. But his name was Toussaint L'Ouverture, right? Toussaint L'Ouverture. Now, originally his name was actually Toussaint Breda, like so, yeah, because that is actually the plantation that he was born on to African parents, right? So the thing about it, though, is Toussaint L'Ouverture is a former slave and a self-educated man. Now, not completely what we do believe happened to him, because here's the hard part, y'all. He was born a slave, so we don't know much about his early life. We actually see most of his life really get kicked off when he turned about 50 years old. And as we know already from studying some of his other historical figures, typically your biography tends to wind down in your 50s. Like, you know, Caesar got stabbed when he was about like, oh, give or take 144. What is that number? Uh, so, yeah, 144. Uh, so, yeah, like Caesar got stabbed like in the 60s, right? Like, so, yeah. And then also looking at it as well, like Napoleon had taken over all of Europe by the time he was 50, right? Well, Toussaint L'Overture is like, well, of course, really, really quickly, he changed his name to L'Overture because it means the opener of doors, right? Literally, his story gets started in his 50s because he actually at this point had been educated himself and he actually had earned some medical training and actually started working in one of these slave revolts as a field doctor, right? And he, the thing about it was is he was untrained in the military and in political matters, but he used his educated mind and the fact that he knew how to read and write to study the military campaigns of other famous generals, just like Napoleon did, and became a skilled general and diplomat, right? And he took leadership of the slave revolt that broke out in 1791 as it continued to roll forward after the man that started the voodoo ceremony had died, right? And the thing about it is, is he organized them together. He taught them certain skills. He made it so they weren't a group of like militia men. He turned them into a well-trained army, right? And he led a hundred thousand men in the slave revolt that began to really wash its way all over the entirety of the colony of San Dumont. And he was so successful, in fact, that literally the other powers in the Caribbean, the Spanish government was literally like, hey, Toussaint, how about you stop being loyal to France and you become an officer in our military? And the deal will be, we will abolish slavery in your colony, but we will get the land as a part of our country, right? And Toussaint considered this very, very heavily. And to stop this from happening, the National Assembly, with Robespierre involved, comes in and says, Toussaint, do not leave France. Stay with us. We need to make money off the sugar and the coffee grown in this colony because we are in the middle of a revolution. So please leave the Spanish army, rejoin us, and we will outlaw slavery. And so Toussaint said, we, oui, we. Oui. And literally, he got like slavery abolished in this colony, right? They're still a part of France at this point, but the thing was is he gets the slavery abolished completely and actually becomes a working part of the French government, right? Toussaint L'Overture led this revolt and literally accomplished so much in such a short span of his life, right? And as you can see right here in his triumphant victory portrait, he literally actually became the leader of the colony itself, regulated the production of food and goods, made it so they were actually focusing on feeding everyone and making sure also that that the colony would run smoothly. But then, of course, we've got this turd who shows up. Now, everything changes when Napoleon comes onto the scene. Because in January of 1802, this is literally almost 10 years into like San Dumont being a slavery-free society, 
the French troops are going to land, like French troops are going to land in Saint Dumont. Now, I don't know if y'all remember this or not. But I told you earlier, I don't like Napoleon for two key reasons. One, he was extremely sexist and rude to women and took their rights away. And two, he tried to bring slavery back in one of his colonies. This is that colony. All right, so like this is the colony that he tried to bring slavery back into because he was like, we'll make more money if we go back to using slavery. But this person, Toussaint L'Overture, is standing in our way. That is absolutely disgusting, and it's why if Napoleon is, I meet him in the afterlife, I'm punching him in the face. All right, so like, no, look, so the French people, what's going to end up happening is like he's going to actually accuse Toussaint of setting up another uprising, right? And he sets up a meeting, and that meeting was actually a trap, right? He didn't even go himself, right? He didn't even go himself. He set a trap for Toussaint L'Overture and literally had him arrested and then sent him to prison in the French Alps where Toussaint L'Overture would die about 10 months later. After liberating his people, he died in April of 1803, right? The thing about it was, though, is there's a guy in the realm that I haven't talked about yet, right? There was a man, as we know, all great leaders have assistants in the wings that were there the whole time. And the name of Toussaint L'Overture's second in command was a man by the name of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, right? Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who is pictured right here, who had a very different story compared to Toussaint L'Overture. Jean-Jacques Dessalines was born a slave himself but was never set free on his own right or manumitted, right? He lived on one of the most violent slave plantations that existed in San Dumont. He literally witnessed the death of women and children at the hands of white overseers. He, he himself was tortured on the, like, the plantation that he actually worked on. So the thing about it was, Napoleon, you've done gone and screwed up because now this man is in charge and he's mad, right? Like So like, yeah, Toussaint's general, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, comes into power and in January 1st, 1804. Jean-Jacques Dessalines declares Haiti to be a new independent country, and he uses guerrilla warfare, and he has a little aid as, like, on his side as well, yellow fever, which crushes the French army, right? Guerrilla warfare tactics and the fact that disease swept through the French army and killed so many of them gave Jean-Jacques Dessalines the military upper hand that he needed, right? Now, it becomes the very first black colony to ever free itself from European control and the second colony ever to revolutionize from Europe. It went the United States of America and then bang, Haiti was the next up, right? And he became the very first emperor of Haiti. Now, Jean-Jacques Dessalines was later assassinated, actually. He was actually stabbed to death in an assassination attempt later on in a revolt. And in 1820, Haiti became an independent republic with democratic elections, right? And most of this was done. Why did all of this happen? It's because it's a massive effect of the French Revolution, okay? So big thing, if you want to write this down just so you know the thematics of this whole thing, why this all went down and why this all happened is because the Napoleon and his campaigns and the French Revolution caused massive confusion in their colonies, giving these people the ability to actually rise up and make countries of their own, right? Same thing happened in South America as well. A man by the name of Simon Bolivar, who has a street in New Orleans named after him and a statue of himself in New Orleans, created the, country of, the countries of Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and liberated themselves from the Spanish while Napoleon was invading Spain, right? Same thing happened as well, like Jose de San Martin in the southern area of South America liberated Argentina and Chile and actually liberated them away from like European control and created brand new countries without European influence and without European governments, right? So the thing about it is, is Napoleon and his campaigns caused that much confusion that Latin American countries came into the world and became countries of their own. But that right there is where we're going to end this flip. We'll talk more about it. We'll go a little bit deeper in our warm-up tomorrow. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, Toussaint L'Overture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and all these other characters as well. And we'll get a little bit more intense with it, okay? But yes, that's exactly right. Thank you, Mr. Terry, for the past. I do greatly appreciate that, right? But let's go ahead and get into it and show G period what's up, right? Because G period, y'all are awesome. Y'all are fantastic. You're great. Y'all impress me every day. And I cannot wait to start reading this book with y'all, all right? But going into it, though, we are now going back over to Europe and discussing the amount of chaos and nation building that's going to be going on in Europe, actually from 1815 to like 1914, all right? So now look, the thing about it is, though, is you got to understand where we left off in Europe, we were discussing the rise of the those isms, right? We were discussing the rise of conservatism, classical liberalism, and socialism in a post-French revolutionary world, right? We were talking about the expansion of these different ideas in this 
crazy, all begotten, like ballistic stuff that was going on at the time, right? But now what we're going to be doing is we're going to kind of continue that whole thing going forward and discuss why are these conservatives so up in arms? What do they want to go back to? What do the classical liberals want? What do the socialists want? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the thing you have to understand before you can really analyze what's going on is that Europe has changed a drastic amount, y'all. Like, Europe has changed so much during the 1800s. You had one guy named Napoleon take over 85% of it. He then gets exiled, not once, but twice. And then also you had an entire industrial revolution on going on inside of Great Britain that nobody even knew about, right? And that industrialism is now spreading throughout the continent, right? Right about by about 1850, okay? It's going to be fully spread throughout the continent. But going around like 1820, it's going to start spreading very dramatically. And you're going to see the rise of steam-powered factories. And, of, and also the laying of railroads all throughout Europe, right? So we're going from a lifestyle that looked like this, where Europe was mostly agrarian, and we're now moving into a lifestyle that's much more like this, where it's much, much more industrial, right? And people are now being concentrated. They're now urbanizing, and they're beginning to move into cities, and they're beginning to actually see one another for the problems that exist in society. Factory workers are beginning to commiserate with one another and be like, wait, our jobs are awful, and we get paid nothing, and the factory owner gets most of the profit? That's ridiculous, right? And then also you're going to see a bunch of consequences of industrialism start popping up, including overcrowded cities, the spreading of disease, and extreme pollution going on around in these cities as well. Now, the thing about it that you need to understand, though, is this is all going on during that thing that we referred to in class earlier and in an earlier flip called the Age of Metternich, right? The Age of Metternich lasted, of course, from 1815 to 1848, and it might have been light on international warfare. It may very well have been light on international warfare, but it was not light on violence, right? And political turmoil was at an all-time high, right? Now, when I mean political turmoil, I mean political unrest, right? You got to understand that all these isms are beginning to feud with each other, right? The conservatives want one thing, the liberals want one thing, the socialists want one thing. And let's talk about those things that they want, right? The conservatives wanted social order and absolutism back. They wanted to go back to the Europe that had always existed before 1789, before the French Revolution began, going back to an absolutist in power. There were still feudal like lords out there. How like literally the uh, entirety of like what wealth and land ownership resided in one elite class, right? They want all that stuff back, right? The Liberals, on the other hand, though, are the people that are the middle class people that have been making money off the Industrial Revolution, that are moving their way up since, into society, and they've been inspired directly, y'all, by the Enlightenment, right? And so they want these Enlightenment ideas. They want legislative bodies like they have in Great Britain. They want parliaments. They want, like, <clears throat> excuse me, national assemblies, right? They want constituents elected by regular people that will go out there and fight for laws that they believe in, right? They want voting, Sort of. Like, like, they want people with land and money to vote. They don't want the poor people to vote. But, like, now, they want limited suffrage, y'all. They also want economic independence. They want no restrictions on their, like, economy. They want laissez-faire. 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 Economics, right? Big word that they want right there, okay? They also want to make sure that the government is not tampering with things. They want to get rid of mercantilism completely, and they want to embrace capitalism as much as they can, okay? Now, going into our next one, we need to also understand... That the workers, which are predominantly socialists, they, a lot of them didn't even know they were socialists, but they were socialists, right? Want food! Like, you, you know, like food's pretty cool. Like, I like eating. Like, eating's pretty awesome, right? They want, like, you know, to be fed because you've got a lot of crazy stuff going around. And what you don't know right now is in the background of this entire movement... There actually is a limited amount of food, y'all. There's a food scarcity situation going on, and a lot of it's being caused by this thing referred to as the Great Famine. We'll get to what that means and what was going on in the 1800s and why bread prices were at an all-time high because a group of workers are dying off. But the thing we also need to understand is they want better working conditions. They want voting to be universal. They want to vote just like everybody else. And they also want... Food, right? Like so, and both of these groups right here share a common want. They want constitutions. They want natural rights. They want the things the Enlightenment has promised them. And the conservatives right there want to make sure that that stays out of their minds. All right. Now, going into it, that you have to understand though as well is there are no wars between or no wars between countries. And Latin America may be liber liber liberating itself, but Europe is in turmoil from within. Right. And a good example of this is the fact that France went through not one, not two. 
not th like three, but actually four kings in the long run in 30 years. I know it says, but three kings. Well, it's because this guy right here in the middle named Louis the 19th actually was only king for like 20 minutes. Like, so like, now, because you have to understand, France going through three kings, three official kings in 30 years, really demonstrates how politically tumultuous things were during the 1800s. Because it's only one of these guys died while he was in his reign. The other two abdicated the throne, right? To abdicate means to step down or leave. Actually, technically, if you count Louis the 19th, it's three guys abdicated the entire process. Because what France decided to do after the Congress of Vienna is go back to what they used to use, right? They went back to the old Bourbon monarchs. They went and found Louis the 16th's brother, right? I'm sure y'all remember Louis the 16th, the guy that was married to Marie Antoinette, that ended up having a tragic fate with a guillotine and stuff like that. The thing that ends up happening, though, is Louis the 18th, his brother, comes into power. Okay? And he actually is known as the desired one, and he actually did a really good job, and he had some liberal ideas and stuff like that. But he ended up dying from an infection in his leg caused by wet and dry gangrene, right? And then his other brother takes over, named Charles X, who is actually an extremely conservative tool bag, who limits freedom of the press, who wants to give people the death penalty if they steal church objects and all this other stuff. And that guy is going to inspire a very tiny revolution that happened in about three days, right? And a fearing violence and what happened to his brother when he was guillotined to death during the French Revolution, he abdicated the throne and then was replaced by this guy named Louis Philippe, the Duke of Orleans, right? And the thing that ends up happening to Louis Philippe or Louis Philippe I is he does the exact same thing that Charles does and he abdicates the throne as well during another crazy little kind of revolution that broke out in 1848. And that's going to be a big theme coming up soon. Now, liberal ideas of constitutional governments are spreading in secret through things like Austria, Prussia, Italy, France, most of the known continent at the time. And it's leading to a lot of people beginning to organize. And they're beginning to say, you know what? It's really screwed up that we are being subjected to these old conservative ideas, right? And so revolts of mostly peasants are breaking out like all over the place. Not full-blown revolutions quite yet, but just revolts, right? One of these revolts is going to be the thing that gets sends this guy away, right? And then one happens 18 years later that ends up sending him away. But some of the examples of some of these revolts are like the Peterloo Massacre, the Decemberists, and the Three Glorious Days, right? The Peterloo Massacre was a massive public demonstration that was held by thousands of individuals that showed up in Manchester Field in England, and they were protesting freedom before the law, equality before the law, the repealing of these things called the Corn Laws, right? And also trying to like, increase the amount of voting and po like political... Uh, participation that was available in Great Britain. And so the British conservative government decided to actually just send a drunk cavalry in to attack the mob and stuff like that and to attack the protest that was going on that literally was just trying to get order and like simple things accomplished. That drunk cavalry rode in and ended up killing 18 people. The very first person that died was a young child that was knocked out of his mother's hands and trampled by one of the horses, right? As we can see right here, some of the people that were actually like trampled on in that mass breaking up of a protest. As we know in American history, protests are a right that, that we believe you have in the constitutional government, right? So this right here is a disgusting show of conservative aggressive power. The Decemberists is another big one where literally a, a bunch of Russian uh, military officers were super frustrated that they weren't getting the king that they wanted, right? There was this one king named Constantine that they wanted who was next in line for the throne, but he actually behind closed doors had decided that he didn't want to be king anymore, and he actually ends up kind of stepping down in favor of his actual brother, Nicholas, right? Nicholas I of Russia. And Nicholas is a conservative tool, and a bunch of these military officers were like, we will not serve for that guy, that conservative jerk. We want a liberal leader like Constantine. And so Nicholas had them all shot. And so like now, and then had five of them hung and then sent the rest of them out to Siberia, which is really messed up. This one right here is the Three Glorious Days that actually happened. And literally it took place on July, wait, July, haha, 28th, 29th, and 30th in 1830, where literally the like people of France had like a little baby revolution where they threw debris into the streets. They built barricades. They freaked out. And the king got so scared that he ran away, right? So literally going into it, you have to understand that these revolts are breaking out all over the place. And we're coupling it together with another crazy thing that's going on, this time period known as the Hungry 40s. So not only are protests going around all over the place, but another causing factor of these protests and a causing factor of things getting worse is by the time that the 1830s finally finish up and you've seen all of these protests and revolts going on, you're now getting hit with extremely high bread prices, right? And it's because during the 1840s, it was literally known as the Hungry 40s. And bread prices were spiking out. Why were they spiking out? It has to do with this thing known as the Irish Potato 
blight, or the Great Famine that you might have actually heard of before, or the Irish Potato Famine that actually occurred from 1845 to 1849. And it had to do with the fact that there was a fungal disease that was killing all of the potatoes that were actually being grown in Ireland, right? And the reason why it was being killed or killing all these potatoes is because they were only growing one type of potato, and it's called a monoculture disease, right? And so we'll explain all of that stuff right there, though, and really get into the nitty-gritty of why bread prices are spiking, what's going on out there in Europe, how all this stuff is just hitting the fan when I see y'all in class, but y'all have a good one.